everyone. Uh, my name is Nick Falk, and I'm the president here at the George Washington University chapter of the Alexander Hamilton Society. Just want to thank you all for coming today. Um, we want to welcome you to our Afghanistan, Asia, and the future of the Middle East strategy uh, event. So thank you all for being here. Before we start, I'd like to go over some announcements. First and foremost, tonight we will be doing our best to guard against COVID-19. In order to do, to do that, it is mandatory that everyone in our audience keep their face masks on throughout the event. Additionally, if you haven't done so already, please make sure that you are signed into the event so that we can carefully monitor our attendance. If you haven't already signed in, you can do so after the event. Also, you may have noticed the QR code projected on the screen earlier. It's a survey that we are using to gauge interest for an ambitious event next semester, and we would appreciate your input, so please fill out the survey. Finally, tonight we will be having a question and answer period from the audience following our speaker's remarks. So please keep your questions in mind, and if you have a question, you will have an opportunity to ask. However, you should know that we are recording this event, um, so if you have a question, it will be recorded. Now I would like to introduce our speakers for tonight. Dr. Favor, or Fever excuse me, is a professor of political science and public policy at Duke University and is director of the Duke Program of American Grant Strategy. He is author of Armed Servants, Agency, Oversight, and Civil Military Relations, and of Guarding the Guardians, Civil Control of Nuclear Weapons in the United States, and has co-authored several other pieces. Dr. Fever has also served as the Director of Defense Policy and Arms Control and as Special Advisor for Strategic Planning and Institutional Reform on the National Security Council at the White House, where his responsibilities included the National Security Strategy, Regional Strategy Reviews, Nuclear Weapons Arm Control, and other defense-related issues. He is a member of the Aspen Strategy Group and is a contributor to Shadow Government at ForeignPolicy.com. Our other speaker and moderator for tonight is Professor Downs, who is the co-director of the Institute for Security and Conflict Studies at the George Washington University. Downs' book, Targeting Civilians in War, was published by Cornell University Press in 2008 and won the Joseph Lepko Prize awarded by Georgetown University for the best book in international relations published in that year. In 2016, Downs was named the winner of the inaugural Emerging Scholar Award given by the International Studies Association to recognize scholars under the age of 45 or within 15 years of receiving their PhD, Bigger. who are judged to have, <laughs> yeah, who are judged to have made the most significant contribution in the field of security studies. Downs has also held, held fellowships at Harvard University's Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs, the Olin Institute for Strategic Studies, and the Center for International Security and Cooperation at Stanford University. We are all very lucky to be have, to have these two incredible speakers here tonight. So if you could all please give them a round of applause. You're welcome to start. Uh, thanks for that kind introduction. Uh, very nice to be here. Uh, and I, I wouldn't want to be remiss uh, without pointing out uh, my book just came out. I literally got the first <laughs> copies on Saturday. Uh, it's right up here if you want to check it out. Uh, Focus in on that. Zoom in. Right. <laughs> Zoom in on the beautiful cover. Um, book about foreign imposed regime change. Uh, so if you're interested in that, uh, please uh, check it out. I'm not too uh, proud to uh, hawk it uh, fervently. Okay, so uh, welcome and thanks for having us. We're super lucky to have uh, Professor Fever here tonight. Uh, I like to call him uh, Dr. Johnny Fever, but probably only he and I get that joke uh, from WKRP in Cincinnati long ago. Um, he's uh, my former colleague, well, he's still there, I'm not, uh, at Duke University. Uh, an expert, noted expert on civil military relations, uh, about which he's written extensively. You've read some of the, the, the books there before. Also, if there's any, ever anything about generals or civil military relations in the New York Times, uh, he's bound to be uh, quoted in it. Um, what you may not know is that uh, Professor Fever has also written a book called Getting the Best Out of College. So. Maybe you will uh, check that out. It's, uh, it's blurbed by luminaries, including uh, Coach K, who I just learned maybe in a little hot water, uh, but also Bob Woodward. Uh, and he has a, I'm not sure what to call it, a, a wicked running right-handed <laughs> over-the-head hook shot. Eyes uh, closed, you know, <laughs> prayer. You can sometimes uh, accompanied by some kind of screech or yell. Um, but it goes in more often than you would think. Uh, and I learned to fear it on the basketball court uh, at Duke when we played in our whole old person game. Um, but seriously, uh, we're here to talk tonight about US foreign policy, 
brand strategy, particularly in Asia, uh, broadly defined to include the Middle East, uh, Central Asia, including Afghanistan, and the, of course the Far East, uh, i.e. China, and the future of uh, US commitment there. So some of the things we'll probably cover, uh, uh, Afghanistan, uh, as you all know, President Biden uh, followed through on President Trump's commitment to withdraw fully from the country, which triggered in quick succession the collapse of the Afghan army, uh, a Taliban rush to Kabul, where it seized power, a stampede of Afghans who had worked with the United States and NATO uh, to get to the airport and get out of the country, uh, which culminated in multiple disasters, including the suicide bombing that occurred at the airport, separation of families, lots of people left behind, um, and the U.S. drone strike uh, that went awry. Um, so, a move that's been loudly criticized by voices on both sides of the aisle, but largely in step, it seems, with U.S. public opinion, which seemingly has little appetite uh, for what they call the forever wars. So, we'll talk about maybe what will, what will the fallout be uh, for U.S. reputation, for future interventions, uh, ability of the US, to, the U.S. to build coalitions, uh, the global war on terror, uh, not to mention uh, the Afghan people and how to deal with the Taliban regime, uh, now that it's there. Um, why was it so urgent, for example, to get out uh, when the US commitment uh, was so minimal? Uh, and a similar commitment uh, in Iraq, right, generates little controversy. We still have roughly the same number of troops in Iraq that we would that we had before in Afghanistan, uh, and as little sort of little noticed and little remarked upon. Um, then, sort of moving, well, I'm going to bounce back to the West, I guess, Iran. Um, as you know, President Trump pulled the United States out of the JCPOA, the uh, nuclear agreement with with Iran, uh, and ever since the, the Iranians have been taking sort of incremental steps to push the boundaries of. Uh, the limits included in the agreement. Um, many thought that the advent of the Biden administration uh, would mean a quick return uh, to an agreement, if not the same agreement, uh, but it hasn't happened. Uh, the United States wants more in terms of the terms and coverage beyond just the nuclear uh, issue, and Iran wants compensation <laughs> for uh, the damage it feels was done uh, to its economy in the ensuing years. Um, and now, of course, you have a much more conservative administration that's uh, taken power uh, in Iran. So what are the prospects for a new agreement? Um, uh, how you know, will the US be able to sort of cobble together its allies again uh, after having you know, pulled out of the previous agreement? Uh, and if no agreement, what then? Um, what would the uh, policy options be with regard to Iran? Um, turning to China, um, the sort of new consensus, right, is that China is a, a strategic competitor and we're headed for a new Cold War uh, of some kind. Maybe not the same Cold War we had before, but a Cold War. Uh, the pivot to uh, Asia began under Obama, got significantly nastier under Trump, uh, and Biden has largely continued uh, his predecessor's policies here uh, with regard to Taiwan, with regard to tariffs uh, and so on, and this move to intensify uh, strategic cooperation with some allies, including uh, the awkwardly named AUKUS, uh, uh, among others. Um, so, you know, lots of questions there. What does the future hold? Is cooperation possible on some issues while competition continues on others? The United States seems to think, yes, we can cooperate on climate change. The Chinese seem to think otherwise. Um, is the clash inevitable? Uh, if you've seen the latest Foreign Affairs, uh, my old dissertation advisor John Mearsheimer is in there singing his, his tune that he always sings, which is that things are gonna get bad because uh, China's gonna try to dominate its region. It's gonna try to force the United States out. Um, so what should you approach be there? I'll just briefly mention North Korea, yet another <laughs> thorn in everybody's side. Uh, you know, multiple administrations over 30 years now have not been able to limit, restrain uh, North Korea's nuclear uh, program. Uh, and now they have an unknown you know, number of warheads, maybe in the low dozens. Um, 
and possible hydrogen bomb capability, an active missile program, and testing ICBMs, and testing submarine launch ballistic missiles, not to mention the conventional artillery threat to Seoul. Um, what, if anything, should the United States do about that, right? The North's nuclear and missile programs. Sabotage, cyber, uh, uh, kinetic attack, uh, do nothing, rely on deterrence, uh, and Kim, Kim Jong-un's survival uh, instinct. Um, so that's a naughty problem too. And then finally, at the broad level, um, questions of, of US strategy and US grand strategy. Right? There's a, a spirited debate going on, whether you know about it or not, uh, between sort of proponents of the status quo or sort of what's been called deep engagement of continuing US alliances and presence uh, throughout the world versus the restrainers, right? the people who say, uh, you know, we're pretty secure. Why are we, uh, you know, far flung all over the world? Uh, in all these places, uh, shouldn't we come back, get rid of these freeloading allies, they can take care of themselves, uh, bring the boys back home, etc. cetera. Um, so what, what is the future of US grand strategy? Can you even have a grand strategy? Uh, and is it always desirable to have one? Uh, with so much change happening all the time. So I think those are some of the Issues that we'll touch on. You got answers to all that, yeah. right? That's, that's, a, that's a heavy, uh, heavy load. Oh yeah. You got I think we could wrap up now and just yeah. so, yeah. Good night, everyone. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Um, so I guess I'd like to start out with Afghanistan, which is, you know, probably fresh in everybody's minds from what's what's happened there recently. Um, uh, I heard not to not to mention Mirshaimer too many times, but I saw him last week at this. Um, Realism and Restraint Conference here in town, uh, and he's, he, he confidently predicted the era of liberal interventionism is over. Uh, this has been so traumatic, and we've finally lived, these crazy liberals intervening all over the place are finally learning their lesson. Um, what do you think the, the lessons of Afghanistan are, if any? So, uh, first of all, it's, it's, it's good to be here, um, it's especially an honor to, to ride side saddle with Alex Downs. You're very fortunate to have him. He's one of the great minds in this field um, and uh, also a lot of fun in the classroom, I gotta believe. Um, and used to be very good on basketball. I gather that, that those days may be behind him, but he, he, you wouldn't know what to look at him, but he was a very lethal outside shooter. Uh, and, uh, and so, uh, at least in, in the land of the blind of the old men that we played with, <laughs> this guy was the king. Okay, Marksman. <laughs> um, so, uh, in terms of Afghanistan, uh, I, th I think it was a mistake to, uh, to leave. And I think it was a classic case of the sunk cost fallacy, but not in the way that it's commonly understood. Uh, the sunk cost fallacy is when you look backwards and say, man, I've spent so much on this thing, I gotta try to redeem it. Uh, but there, that can also turn up the other way, man, I've spent so much on this thing, this is not worth it. However, the properly understood from a strategic point of view, I believe, is you look forward and say, those costs that we've spent are sunk. We can't recoup them. But what is the cost of staying next year, and what is the benefit of staying next year? And going forward, the, the way too much had been spent on Afghanistan in the past, but they had reduced the level of burden on the United States uh, to a manageable level, a tolerable level by 2017, uh, even before then. But, I, but the level that was, the cost of it, uh, both in terms of um, human life, the American life, but also uh, treasure, uh, preoccupation of the, of the strategic you know, mindset, all of these things, the burden was manageable. What were we getting it for that? We were getting a shot for Afghanistan to have a better future. It was a low likelihood uh, that it was going to turn out well for reasons that Alex um, has outlined well in this book. Um, but it was a shot, and what we were also getting was uh, a guarantee that 
Afghanistan would not become a safe harbor for terrorists of global reach with the ambition of striking us or our allies. And in exchange for that, we had a certain uh, sort of cost of, of what the Israelis called mowing the lawn. You know, it was a, a problem that would not go away. Uh, you wouldn't solve it, but you would manage it. That, I believe, uh, and Hal Brands and I wrote a piece saying, you know, it's not a great out outcome, but it, it's, a, it's a viable, tolerable outcome. And while it's true that the war was not popular with the American people, no one was eagerly cheering it on, it was also not a political burden for uh, President Obama or for President Trump or for President Biden. They were paying no real cost, except among a tiny number of, of their elites who cared about the issue. But by and large, it was a zone of choice. And when Obama looked at that choice, he said, man, I would love to go down to zero, but I think it's better to keep it at you know, 10 to 14, uh, where he uh, had, he was trying to get lower and did get lower before uh, he left office. And Trump came in and he wanted to go to zero. And when he was presented with the options and told what might happen, he says, look, he backed off from going to zero and, and kept it at the 10 to 15 until the, the deal had come with the Taliban, crack that for a moment. Uh, and Biden, it, was, it took President Biden, who heard the same briefings that the previous presidents said, he said, I don't care, we're going to do it anyway. We saw the result. I'm not sure that that result was what well, I know that that result, what we saw, was what scared Trump away from doing it, probably also scared Obama away from doing it. I don't know whether President Biden, if he had been had a crystal ball and could have seen, this is what's going to happen in August, September, would you still go through it? I suspect he still would, because he was really locked in on it. But it is, Biden had a problem that Trump did not have, or rather, Biden had a problem that Trump created. And that was the deal that was signed uh, with the Taliban in February, March um, 2020, which set a fuse, it lit a fuse to a bomb that was going to, to blow up on Biden's watch, that you either had to leave uh, or this fuse was going to blow up on Biden's watch. And the, the war, which had been a, a bloody stalemate that what was the U.S. winning? No. Was, was U.S. and Afghan allies certainly losing? I would say no. You could, you could get other experts here. Carter Malkili, Jim, for instance, he'd say probably they were losing uh, in 2018. We, our side was losing 2018. But for sure, starting in January, February 20, once that deal was cut, that's when the accelerated loss. And so Biden, what Biden had available to him was not the preferred option that I, that I would have had. Okay, that's my assessment and why I was uh, opposed to leaving. Having left, uh, what, what do we know? Well, we know that, uh, that the uh, price that the Afghan people paid uh, was paid much higher, much faster, uh, and it all came due on TV you know, for everyone to see. That's the first thing we know. The second thing we know is that the idea that Afghanistan had been this, this drain on the administration and they, they finally got rid of it is exactly backwards. Afghanistan was not a drain until they decided to leave and then it sucked all of the energy out of the administration, uh, particularly from July on. Uh, talk to any administration, senior administration official about what July, August, September was like, and it was all Afghanistan all the time for them. Uh, couldn't do anything else. Uh, it was reminiscent of where Iraq war was for the Bush administration in the darkest days of 2006. That's not where Afghanistan was in January, and that certainly wasn't the case for Trump, who could ignore Afghanistan for most of his time. Uh, and so the, that price was much higher than the administration paid. And of course, if those are the only two prices, then it's still a tra it's a tragedy for the Afghan people. 
there's some missed opportunities for the U.S. But in terms of the costs of U.S. national interest, if we don't, if that's the sum total of it, then I'd say okay, we may have, uh, maybe it was a, a decent deal. It's not the one I would have made, but maybe it paid off for Biden. Of course, the real problem is what is the future situation? Will Afghanistan return as a breeding ground, as a safe harbor for terrorists of global reach? And here's, and I'll close my point here and go back to you. Take a look at what the administration officials are saying, what General Milley has said about Afghanistan, and what Dr. Colin Call, who's the Under Secretary of Defense for Policy, has said about Afghanistan and the prospect of future terrorist threats emanating from Afghanistan. The rhetoric and their assessment of the terrorist threat, this is the Biden people, not outsiders like me. Biden people's assessment of the threat is roughly where the Bush administration assessed the threat in 2002. So we're 20 years into the global war on terror and the threat their description of the threat is it's about as bad as it was in 2002. Now, there are some other things that have changed. We're better prepared. We have the Homeland Security. We have resilience. We have protective measures. And then we also have enormous threats in the rise of China that is um, distracting us from this. But in terms of what is the level of the terrorist threat, their rhetoric describes it as similar to 2002. That's a scary fact. And that suggests to me that, uh, I hope I'm wrong, but it suggests to me that we might pay a price for having lost the Overwatch capability uh, on Afghanistan. That was gonna be my, my follow-up was the, well, how do you assess the, the likelihood of, of that happening, of the you know, global reach terrorists being reestablished in Afghanistan? And of course, ISIS-K uh, is already uh, launched attacks uh, against the Taliban regime uh, uh, in Afghanistan. And are they more concerned with with, uh, with taking over Afghanistan, or would that, if they did, would it give them the ability to, to reach out further? That, that remains to be seen. Um, I'd love to get your take on what happened to the Afghan army, but I want to get too deep in the weeds, so I'll ask you. Well, I can answer that very quickly. What it is is that they, we designed an army that would work well enough if we were there. And we provided uh, the critical enablers and, crucially, our contractors. Yeah, the spare parts and all that. Yeah, the logistics and supply chain and some of that. So it was, a, it was an army that could uh, fight reasonably effectively, and they did fight reasonably effectively, as long as they, were, they had reason to believe the U.S. would be there indefinitely. Once they got a sense that the U.S. was not going to be there uh, indefinitely, then you saw a lot of local commanders cutting deals. And then once the U.S. pulled out its support, the thing collapsed uh, in like a house of cards. They saw which way the wind was blowing. Um, what do you think it says about Biden uh, that he went forward with this? Um, that he was willing to uh, pay the human cost uh, or let the Afghans pay the human cost uh, of uh, a U.S. Uh, withdrawal from Afghanistan. What does it tell you about him and his strategic priorities? What kind of leader? So I had a student in my office, it might have been yesterday, I'm losing track of days, uh, asked me what, if I had to describe uh, Biden in a single word, what would it be? I sat there for a minute and I said, maybe pragmatist? Uh, maybe, because he's really pulled some quite realist uh, moves uh, recently, so I wondered what your your take on him is in general was given this. Uh, it's funny because I wouldn't have said I mean, there is a pragmatic streak to him. There's also a stubborn streak to him. So th I think what we were seeing is a stubborn streak. Uh, presidents, when they're pushed against the wall, tend to do the moves that got them elected. And but Biden doesn't seem to fit that pattern. But if you think about the last, the, the previous presidents before him, how did Obama get elected? He got elected by opposing a intervention that most of the, uh, you know, national security elite in both parties thought we had to do. 
And that's why he got elected president. And so when his back was up against the wall, what did he do? He went against the advice. So that was what he did, say, with the red line in, in Syria. Or he tried really, really hard to stayed as long, late as possible before going back into Iraq 2014. What about Bush? You know, Bush was, what got him elected in 2000 was he campaigned like he was the front runner in the primary, even though he wasn't. He campaigned like he was the front runner in the general, even though he wasn't. And then when the election was over and they're counting the votes, he can't, he acted like he had won that before it had been called, you know, he, he just was uh, doubling down. And so when, his, when the chips were down for him, Iraq, he doubled down. Clinton triangulated between right and left. And so when the chips were down, Clinton always triangulated. So this is a pattern you can see across presidents. With Biden, I think what, what happens to him is he goes back to policy debates in the past that he lost he was on the losing side and says, now's my chance to, to do it right. And so he would have been on the losing side of a number of Iraq and Afghanistan debates earlier when he was vice president, before that when he was senator. And this was his chance. And by golly, he was not going to let other people talk him into the thing he didn't want to do. And so I think that's, that's as much as any, any explanation. He's got very good people around him. They're, you know, it's a, it's a team that has a lot of expertise, a lot of experience. Uh, it's In some ways, it's the Democratic Party's A team that's around him. But they're almost all staffers. That is, people who work for him rather than co-equals, people of you know, similar stature. Uh, in previous administration, you know, for Obama, Secretary Clinton was a peer, you know. Uh, in the in the Bush administration, Powell, Rumsfeld, Cheney, you know those they were even though they were technically subordinate to President Bush, and you know certainly showed deference. They nevertheless were peers to him in a way that a typical staffer on the Biden team is not. The only one that fit that is close is Kerry, but Kerry had nothing to do with this. Uh, you know Senator Kerry had nothing to do with Afghanistan. The Afghanistan issue, they're all staff. And so even though I suspect they all opposed the decision, uh, at the end of the day, they they were not able to persuade the president to do otherwise. So one more on this general issue, and then we'll move on to another, uh, another trouble spot. Um, so under, uh, under President Trump, he was not known for uh, giving a lot of love to allies. Uh, and you know, constantly accusing them of being freeloaders, and they needed to pony up for uh, all the things the United States was doing for them. Um, but President Biden is not winning a lot of points in this category either, um, in terms of consultation with the withdrawal from Afghanistan, uh, with uh, what the French might call the stab in the back uh, with regard to AUKUS. Um, do you think this, and then, do you think this is going to have any ramifications for coalition building down the road? So I, I see those issues as, as separate. The administration, if, if you get an administration person uh, offline, away from the camera, and they will say, uh, we did consult with the allies on Afghanistan. There's no way they could not have known what was coming. They didn't like it. They told us not to do it. Uh, but when the president made his decision in, in April of 2021, uh, they knew it was that he was leaning that way. They knew he had made that decision. And so the lack of consultation argument uh, falls flat with Biden insiders. Then you turn this conversation to AUKUS, they say, well, OK, <laughs> uh, you know, mistakes were made. Who made the mistake? That you might get an argument about who's to blame. And publicly, the, the, the Biden team blames the Australians, whose job it was to tell the French that they were reneging on the deal. Um, and uh, you know, there's other, other people you might choose to blame. Uh, but the, uh, the administration doesn't accept the, your characterization of 
the Afghanistan one does accept it uh, and that a price was paid on AUKUS. That said, the, uh, I think the, uh, the allies are still more uh, grateful that the Biden seems to believe allies, you know, unlike President Trump, who, as you, you said, seemed not to believe in the value of allies, point one. And point two, that they, the allies are more concerned with Biden's political collapse. Uh, the French are concerned about Alcus, but the other, other allies are more concerned about Biden's political weakness and what that signals about American weakness and the likelihood of paralysis going forward more than they're concerned about Biden's failure to, to coordinate. I, I still think that, the, that the, the administration as a whole has other things they can point to. Alcus annoyed the French, but it really pleased the British and the Australians. Quad uh, is, a, is a, a diplomatic achievement, and, they moved, and the administration moved that forward. Obviously, showing up at, in Glasgow, big. Uh, success from the globe's standpoint uh, uh, and a big change from the previous administration. So they're probably still net net happier with Biden. What they're worried about is uh, what's his political future? What, and what does that mean for what the future America that they'll be dealing with? That's a grave concern. Yeah, we definitely see the, the difficulty of potential swings back and forth uh, between the two parties. Uh, and, and can I really believe what you know that what you're telling me now and doing now is is going to be the same uh, in four years? Um, let me ask you a question about Iran. Um, so again, there were high hopes uh, among many, anyway, that um, you would get a, a JCPOA version 2.0 um, after Biden came in. He declared this was a priority. There were hints that well, you know, it's not going to be the same old uh, JCPOA. We're going to try and get more, um, but this is something we definitely want to go back to uh, and try and get a handle on a potential Iranian nuclear weapons program. Um, so there was there were negotiations for a while. It was in the news, and now it's seemingly dropped off the radar. Um, you know, obviously the Afghan disaster and other things, uh, uh, COP twenty six and stuff have, have grabbed the headlines. But I just wondered, do you have any insight into what's going on there? And what's your take on whether a new agreement is possible or desirable? So I've been on the losing side of the debate on JCPOA for 10 years or, or more. <laughs> so uh, I'm the wrong guy to ask. I thought the deal was uh, a, a bad deal. That, that I thought that President Obama could have gotten a better deal if he had been uh, willing to uh, push harder. I respect Wendy Sherman, who was the chief negotiator, and she's told me that I'm wrong. I wasn't in the room with the Iranian she was, and she tells me she knows that she couldn't have gotten a better deal. I respect that. I still wonder if that Obama hadn't sort of undercut her a little bit by the eagerness that he showed for the deal. That being said, once the deal was struck, the crucial thing from my point of view was the promises that Wendy Sherman, Jake Sullivan, and others made that said, this just deals with the Iranian nuclear file, and we're going to address the other malign activities that Iran is involved in, including support of terrorism in the region, missile proliferation, other uh, regional instabilities that they're involved in. We will be as tough on that as we were dogged in pursuing JCPOA. That was how they sold the JCPOA uh, to the rest of us. Namely, the deal was narrow, but they understood that they were going to do the rest of it. President Obama felt a different way. President Obama believed that the deal had the potential to be transformative, that it would produce, it would catalyze a regime change, not this kind of foreign imposed regime change that Alice is talking about, but, but a rather a a repentance or a you know a, 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 an awakening, an epiphany in Iran that they would see the benefits of of joining the global uh, world order and economic benefits that would come, and that they would uh, reduce their malign activities similarly. That he he believed the JCPOA itself was transformative, 
And therefore, anything that would jeopardize the JCPOA, to include holding Iran accountable for its malign activities that are not covered by the JCPOA, Obama didn't want to do it. And so they, they had a weak deal that was weakly enforced on the, so, on the margins. So whether Iran was technically in compliance with JCPOA, they weren't doing the rest of the things that the United States wanted. Okay, so that was my view 2016. In comes President Trump. At this point, we have the JCPOA, and I was of the view that they should, that rather than leave the JCPOA, Trump should threaten to leave the JCPOA and get progress from the Allies on all the other malign activities. So rather than blowing up the JCPOA and trying to negotiate again from scratch, which is what uh, they uh, Trump eventually did, instead leveraged the possibility that he might do something like that to get better European cooperation from the other allies. Again, Brian Hook, who's in the room with the Europeans, says, great idea, but I couldn't get the Europeans to do any more. And I, you know, I don't know whether he whether that's true or not. It's hard to get the Europeans to do more on that when you're, you know, when the president's beating them over the head and shoulders on every other issue. There was sort of a, a narrow-minded transactionalism in the Trump approach to allies that you could smack them in the morning and then get something from them in the afternoon and they wouldn't remember that you smacked them in the morning. Uh, in any case, Brian was unable to get anything more and so they blew up JCPOA and now we're in the worst of all possible situations because there are no controls on the Iranian uh, and the, no meaningful controls on the Iranian nuclear program and they can plausibly say we're the ones to blame, not them. And the Europeans think, well, yeah, you kind of are the ones to, to blame. Uh, and so, uh, so what was Biden, Biden promised that they were going to get back into the JCPOA? The, what he could not promise is that he could make a concession big enough that the Iranians would say it's worth it. Because why would the Iranians want to get back into it at this point when they kind of have the whip hand on the US rhetorically, but also uh, because they're able to march forward? Uh, and is Biden really going to you know, use military force? Secretary Blinken has dangled threats that sound like you know, everything's on the table. Uh, but Bibi Netanyahu, who's not the prime minister uh, of in Israel anymore, and uh, is Biden, you know, how credible is Biden's uh, threat in Iran? Maybe the Iranians don't take it as that credible, so then why are they going to make a concession? And guess what? Their leadership are saying, we're not going to make a concession. So the Iranian view is, we'll, we'll be happy to come back to the deal, but first, because you already dissed us once, we want to see all the benefits up front. So give us everything up front, and then you know we'll go, then we're back in business. Well, that gives up all of US leverage. That's a deal so bad, Biden's not going to accept it. So my bet is we're not going to get a deal. But since I've been wrong ever, up until now, you should put 10 bucks on some, some way that the deal reappears that I didn't imagine. No, I, I agree with you on this one. Um, and you kind of have to say the Iranians have a point, right? Which is, if you, if you have a situation now in, in the United States where it's very hard to do formal treaties because you can't get anything ratified in the Senate. And so many of these agreements now are being made as, as executive agreements, uh, which only last as long as the incumbent or his party remains in power. Uh, and as we saw when Trump came in, he didn't like it and he tore it up. Uh, without, you know, that all, so all he had to do was a search for pen. Um, and so, you know, if you're Iran, you know, even when you can get the U.S. to make concessions, uh, you don't know what the future holds, right? So you might as well say, Sh show me the money right now. Um, I think it's worse than that. And this is a good illustration of how more pessimistic. Than yeah, no, yeah. It's, a, it's worse. Like, this is a this is a good illustration of how the devil is in the details, and how a a strategy that may make sense with one configuration of power makes no sense with the other configuration of power. So, the Trump came in wanting to blow up JCPOA. You're absolutely right, but his team talked him out of it for several 
for like 18 months or something. Uh, but what finally rubbed him so raw that he said, the hell with this, I'm breaking it up, was that he had to quarterly certify that Iran was in compliance. So this was a part of the uh, legislation that Congress passed said every quarter or so, the president had to certify, sign a document in his name, Donald Trump certifies Iran is in compliance. That just rubbed Trump's nose in it. And he did. He was furious every time he had to sign that certification. And he finally said, I'm not going to sign anymore. And that's why he got out. Why was that certification requirement there? Because the Republicans rightly said, Obama is not going to enforce his own deal very hard on the Iranians. The, Obama, the Republicans in Congress recognized that Obama would grade the Iranians too softly. So they wanted to force Obama to make a quarterly certification that he that they could you know rub Obama's nose in it. That made a lot of sense when the president wanted the deal. It made no sense when the president didn't want the deal. And so as you guys design clever gambits in your classes on um, how you know you go to be future policymakers, realize that a, a strategy uh, can work really well against one in one team situation and be disastrous in another. My only amendment would be that the Republicans believe that Obama would soft pedal the, the verification uh, measures. Whether or not he was doing that or would do that, the agreement wasn't actually enforced for very long. It was hard to, it was hard to see, but it certainly didn't include a lot of things that, that the Republicans wanted to see. So the last, point on, last question on this is, okay, so if not JCPOA 2.0, then what? Um, you know, as you said, the administration has said, well, you know, it could be, we could do this, we could do that. Um, but what are, what are the United States options here? They all seem to be not so great. So what the administration seems to be trying, uh, flirting with, is trying to uh, wean Syria off of Iran, and so to isolate uh, Iran diplomatically in the region. Uh, and this is a very difficult move, uh, and I'm not sure I would support it. The guy who's in charge of it uh, appears to, this appears to be his idea, Brett McGurk, someone I worked with, I have a lot of respect for him, and so I'd like to hear him explain how this is going to work. Uh, but uh, I, I get the idea of isolating and marginalizing Iran. That's what the Abraham Accords were about, that the Trump administration got one of their great diplomatic, you know, one of the two or three things that they did that is a genuine diplomatic achievement. Um, that was about isolating Iran uh, and, and having the uh, Israel and uh, Arab uh, Gulf states and others acknowledge that they saw Iran as a bigger enemy than Israel. And the idea was, okay, let's broaden that and add even Syria, take Syria away so Iran will really be alone. Wow, I just don't see that happening. I don't see Assad ever abandoning Iran. The one root country that was with him when his back was up against the wall, he's a war criminal, he's a, a horrible person. I can't imagine that the West can make peace with him without justice. Uh, and so I, that feels like um, too Bismarckian, too clever, too, bit, too, too, too clever by half. Uh, I don't think it's viable, but that's if they don't get a deal, that's that's uh, the diplomatic alternative is to try to isolate Iran. <laughs> well, or the other alternative is something that's you know uh, kinetic, mm -hmm. uh, which is worse. So, yeah. do you think we'd try another cyber operation, or we we went down that route and it was just a nuisance and you can't do it enough? We see, we're seeing these things, you know, periodically with assassination of scientists. Well, I, I would imagine that they that there there would be all options on the table. All right. Let's make sure we get to China. Um, uh, so uh, it seems like the sort of new consensus is new Cold War with China. These are these are our pure competitor, and we're going to um, uh, uh, try and contain them. Um, this whole engagement with them in the past was a big mistake. It uh, just merely fed their, uh, 
their economy, they got wealthier, we thought, oh, this will transform them into a democracy, that didn't happen. Uh, now we need to, to change. Um, and uh, do you see any, any differences in the, in the new administration's approach to that from the previous one? Uh, are they charting a new, are they doing more? Are they doing anything different from what um, Trump was doing? Uh, there's a lot more continuity than either side would want to admit, uh, to include Trump's uh, tariffs, which, you know, punitive tariffs, which mostly impose pain on the United States and not on China, but uh, would be diplomatically uh, and from a PR point of view painful to lift now because it would look like it was rewarding China. And so, uh, Somewhat to my surprise, the, the Biden people didn't like eliminate those on day one to sort of reset and try for, uh, a different diplomatic approach. There's no question that the Biden team views China as the pacing threat. That's what they were pacing challenge, I guess. And while they're using different language or strategic competition, not great power conflict, uh, uh, it nevertheless is a focus that China and the rise of China is... Uh, the, a, a grave threat to U.S. interests. And this is understandable because for 30 years, U.S. grand strategy has had as its first and most important pillar the prevent the emergence of a hostile peer rival. That is, pre prevent the, a situation where the U.S. faces somebody that is peer, equal to peer, so the, or close enough to equal that they can challenge the U.S. across multiple domains, economic, military, diplomatic, and globally. So not just a regional problem like North Korea, a regional problem like Iran, a global problem, hostile, and who sees themselves as rivals with the United States. And most of post-Cold War grand strategy can be traced back in some way to that element, of that first pillar. Uh, and the rise of China and the fact that both President Trump and now President Biden have identified China as a hostile peer rival, if they don't, even if they don't use those words, suggests that that's the end of that era, of that grand strategy. Um, and so we're, we're entering a new era. Now, is what to, what to call it? it? There are aspects of it that look like the Cold War. Uh, the fact that we have a hostile peer rival looks like the Cold War. But the differences are just as profound, including the fact that we're economically entangled with China in a way that we never were with the Soviet Union. And so our options to vis-a-vis um, -vis China are very different from the options we had vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union. Moreover, uh, we, Russia is still around, and while it's not a peer at the nuclear level and in the European theater and in the Middle East theater, Russia can, and Arctic, if you want to add that, that there are several theaters where Russia can, can play uh, havoc or be a menace to US uh, national security interests. Uh, and so we got a two-body problem, uh, a China and a Russia. There's a bromance between Putin and Xi Jinping. I'm in the school that thinks that at the end of the day, they think they, they'll break up. You know, kind of a Taylor Swift <laughs> but. Uh, whether who's, who gets the scarf, I don't know. Uh, but uh, but there's no question that they both see an advantage from playing that up, and that gives them leverage. They think of these with the United States and the West, and so uh, that's a two-body problem. That makes it different. Makes it different. But also remember what we said, you and I. What I said to you several hours ago, which was that the terrorist threat is still remains at a level that's elevated over what we thought it was in the 90s, or, or what we thought it was in the 80s. That if I'm right, that, and, or if, not if I'm right, if Colin Call is right, then the terrorist threat is really quite elevated. So you've got that problem as well. And we haven't even mentioned climate change. So if it's it, but that's another big challenge. So there are uh, very serious problems that make the new quote unquote Cold War with China more complicated than in some ways than the Cold War was with the Soviet Union. So I'm sure that strategists are trying to come up with a phrase 
that uh, that is as memorable as Cold War to describe it. Um, but it, uh, it it's hard to come up with that phrase. Yeah, we used to talk about the two being able to fight two major regional contingencies or uh, uh, regional wars in two different areas of the world. But now it's two problems that are quite different and quite separate, uh, but require, you know, and, and you may think, oh, we can pivot away from that terrorist problem, but, you know, we have to keep our eye on Afghanistan plus the Islamic State and Al Qaeda affiliates that have spread all over the world that we're trying to train foreign militaries uh, to deal with. We have our well, and the China problem is even more complex than I just said, and I wish you know, John were here, I would ask him, uh, which is, what's more threatening, that China, China's rise in power or China's cresting of power? So that is China's weakness. It could be, I mean, it's one, one kind of problem if China is inexorably rising and by 2050 they'll be, uh, it, it might even eclipse us in economic and uh, military power. If that's the case, then that suggests one strategy for the U.S. But what if the problem is that China's internal weakness will cause Chinese aggregate power to crest, and that they will then begin to see themselves declining, and so they'll see their a window of opportunity shutting down. What if that's the more dangerous problem? And you, I, I can make the case that that's more likely than China's inexorable rise. That suggests a very different strategy. They're, it's both are scary, but they have different implications for what the U.S. should do. I'd love to know what John would think about that, and maybe you can uh, tell us now or tell us offline. Can I channel John Mearsheimer? We're talking about John Mearsheimer, by the way. Um, so I don't think he sees this. He loves to say China has a huge population, and if it gets as rich as whatever country. You imagine if it has the GDP per capita of Japan or South Korea or something like that, their GDP will be 2.8 or three times uh, that of the United States. So I think he's, he's in the inexorable rise. Inexorable rise. Yeah. Poss and therefore, the preventive or potential, the US would be the declining power and may face that issue of, of preventive war. What Peter is describing, sorry, don't confuse me is that the Chinese uh, economy is slowing down, and it's not going to get back to 6 8 10% growth, and therefore might not get there, and then will go start to go downhill, and they will see that, and then they will face uh, a preventive war. Uh, just tell us when we need to go to Q&A, because we could keep going. Um, let me throw a real- Get the book and yank us off stage. <laughs> 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 Uh, a couple questions about what do you what do you make of uh, China's how threatening or how seriously to take China's military buildup, uh, in, especially in the naval realm and, and the ballistic missile realm, and then the real hot potato uh, Taiwan question, which is another seeming area of continuity, or perhaps even the Biden administration going further down the road uh, towards taking on that. So for 30 years, we haven't had a credible adver an adversary who could credibly threaten our uh, uh, high-value weapons the way the, the Chinese can. That, they, the Soviet Union, of course, could uh, in the Cold War. But if you look at how we actually operated, even in the Cold War, you have to go back to um, Korean War was the last time U.S. troops operated in an environment where the U.S. didn't control the air. Uh, and if you're a soldier on the ground, having dominance of the air, air supremacy, is a huge advantage. And being exposed to air attack is a huge disadvantage. So there's no one in the U.S. military who's ever fought, and no one currently who's ever fought in an environment like is possible in some of the scenarios with the Chinese, where because of missiles, because of uh, advances in their air capability, they could hold at risk not just our sea and our air, but also our ground troops. 
So that's a very serious challenge from uh, you know what the De Department of Defense is wrestling with. That's a really difficult challenge for them to wrestle with. And it creates a, a major potential issue of escalation, which is the first thing the United, in, in, in the event of a war, say over a Taiwan contingency, the first thing the US military is gonna try to do is knock out the Chinese capability to, uh, to contest us in the end. Uh, and uh, some folks like Caitlin Talmadge have written, that poses a potential risk of the Chinese fearing that they might lose their nuclear uh, capability because of the sort of similar capabilities that are used. They often use, are on the same platforms. Uh, they're sometimes co-located. They use the same command and control. Uh, and that they might see this and say, uh-oh, our nuclear deterrent is about to go away. Um, that gets very scary. Yeah, so it, it, this is a, as a pacing challenge, that, which is how the Pentagon uh, describes it, uh, it the, the result is the U.S. is in an arms race, right? And across multiple platforms, across multiple uh, force enablers, artificial intelligence, et cetera, uh, use of space, access to space, access to command and control, resilience of those to cyber attacks, et cetera. There's an arms race across all of these dimensions. And China, the U.S. is still ahead in virtually everything I just mentioned, in some cases far ahead, but they see China catching up faster than any other uh, state and faster than was thought uh, was what was going to happen 30 years ago, 20 years ago, maybe even 10 years ago. I'd love to show a series of charts in my, in my intro to international affairs class. Uh, that shows the ratio of U.S. Uh, to Chinese military spending over the past 15 to 20 years, and how it, it's there's still a big gap, obviously, but the ratio is shrinking from like eight to one, seven to one, five to one. They were down to this two point something uh, to one. All right, everyone, we're going to begin the question and answer period. Um, so please, if you have a question, go ahead and raise your hand. We do ask that you stand up and introduce yourself. And also, please keep the question relatively related to the topic, although it is quite a broad topic. Do basketball is very good as well. Yes. And uh, relatively brief as well, so uh, we can get as many questions as possible. All right? Yes. Guys regarding Afghanistan. So since obviously for the past 20 years, Pakistan and its ISI, which has a mind of its own relative to the Pakistani government, you know, they're quite jubilant that the Taliban have won, like several, I think, their bosses have been publicly saying that. What do you think that'll mean for U.S.-Pakistani relations, which have been quite terrible over the past couple of years? And since Pakistan's getting very close to China, what do you think that will mean? Like, will the Taliban become kind of a subservient regime to the Pakistani ISI now, or will there be internal conflicts like there have been reports coming out over like the past couple of weeks? Do you want to do that or do you want me to go first? You're our guest. Okay, <laughs> so uh, when I trace, uh, you know, who's to blame, why did we lose in Afghanistan? There's uh, lots and lots of things to blame, but two of the biggest ones in my mind are the corruption of the Afghan government and the double dealing of the Pakistani uh, partner. So Pakistan was our partner, helped us somewhat, uh, but also undermined us a lot uh, because they were playing a different, longer game. They knew that eventually, or they believed eventually the U.S. was gonna leave, and when the U.S. left, they were still gonna be there, and so they wanted influence in that world, and they bet on the Taliban, or never, completely bet against the Taliban. But there's two Taliban. There, that, the Taliban they were betting in favor of was the Afghan Taliban. Pakistan is threatened by a what's called the Pakistan Taliban, which has similar ideology, but it's otherwise organizationally not linked to the Afghanistan Taliban. However, it's hard to have victory for the Afghan Talibs and it not redound to Pakistan. So it ne never made sense to me the game that Pakistan was was playing. And 
I would expect that Pakistan will face uh, greater pressure uh, uh, for uh, the, precisely because of the, the decaying situation in Afghanistan. That is, what's left now in Afghanistan is, uh, is a humanitarian disaster because the Western aid has left. Uh, and so there's not enough food and all of and Taliban is unable to turn it around. So Pakistan now has on its border a, a nightmare. And that, I think, is going to come back to haunt Pakistan. And Pakistan's biggest, most attractive form of leverage was helping us in Afghanistan. That's what the leverage they had over the United States. That's gone. And so, uh, what what is their, their what is going to be their leverage to sort of elicit from the U.S. Uh, positive behavior? The other chip they have is control over their nuclear arsenal. That's a very dangerous chip for them to play. So I I think this you know Pakistan may have gotten what they wanted and discovered that they didn't really want it. After all, that, that's my view. Uh, exactly. Um, uh, now that, so yes, they wanted uh, a Taliban victory in Afghanistan. They got it. Um, and now what do they do with it? Uh, and what are the implications of, of that for their relations with the United States? So, you know, we, we started this a long time ago with uh, Pakistan being very useful to the United States uh, when the Soviets were in Afghanistan uh, in the 1980s. Um, and this was you know, part of what led, or mostly what led the United States to continue to certify that the Pakistanis did not have uh, a, nuclear, a nuclear weapon, uh, when we pretty much knew that they did. Um, uh, so then uh, you eventually got, um, you know, the, the, you have to remember Pakistan was a big supporter, if not the f founder or progenitor of the Taliban in the 90s, a uh, big booster. They put their they put their, their chips on, on the Taliban and backed them. Uh, and when the United States and the Northern Alliance overthrew the Taliban regime, of course, where did the, where did the Taliban remnants go? Pakistan, where they were welcomed with open arms. There were actually a lot of Pakistani troops in ISI that got stuck in Afghanistan that had to be flown out because they went the other way uh, when they left. Um, but, you know, yes, they were both supporting the Taliban well for the last 20 years and trying to play nice with us uh, at the same time. And now that uh, we're gone and the Taliban are back in the saddle, what is the Pakistan connection to the United States? What, what's their leverage? How is that relationship going to be maintained, especially when they're kind of on the outside looking in of the relationships the US is trying to build in the region with, uh, obviously, Japan, South Korea, Australia, India, right? Um, Pakistan always says, you know, the reason we're involved in Afghanistan is because of India, right? We need we don't want them to, to get in there, and this is a this is a big threat to us. Um, but I see basically them moving closer to China, which is going to further alienate them from the United States. So I don't see a rosy future uh, for that relationship. Thank you very much. All right, next question. Yes, in the back. Uh, hi. So So the, the Chinese, I suspect, uh, in, draw some psychological you know, benefit from seeing the US humiliated, as, as happened in August and September. Uh, but that in their long-term strategic interest, they would have preferred that the US stay and keep uh, a lid on, on the problem, and that they don't while the Taliban has reached out to them and to Russia as you sort of replace the United States as great power patron, I don't, I don't see China willing to do in Afghanistan what the US was willing to do. And there's uh, the, the chimerical, or the, not chimerical because it's, it's really there, there's tremendous mineral wealth in Afghanistan 
But to extract that, you need a sufficient peace and stability. And so while China is clearly interested in, in those extraction opportunities, the likelihood that Afghanistan will be stable enough for that uh, industry to, you know, to take root is low. So what is in it for Afghanistan? I think what they're right, uh, sorry, for China, probably what they most care about now is uh, quiet so as not to uh, stir up trouble with Uyghur. Uh, and with, you know, sort of like uh, an, in some kind of militant Islamism among the Uyghur population, which China is obviously very worried about. That's exactly where I was going to go, which is the, yeah, Professor Weaver mentioned China might prefer the United States to continue to uh, hold the bag in Afghanistan because it sort of kept the, the terrorism problem down. And remember, so uh, the, one of the biggest domestic threats the, the Chinese regime faces is the Uyghurs in Xinjiang. Uh, they're Muslims. Uh, the Taliban are, are Muslims. Um, many uh, uh, Muslims from other countries have gone to Afghanistan to fight and you know, belong to various organizations that might go back uh, there. And so I think you know this is the probably a uh, worry to them, um, and they're certainly not going to uh, have much interest in uh, establishing any kind of military presence in, in Afghanistan or trying to uh, uh, get further involved there. Can I make a, what I hope is a friendly amendment to what you just said, which is that the Chinese think they have a big threat from the Uyghurs. The Uyghur actually do not pose a threat the, level, the, not, the amount of terror, quote unquote terrorist activity uh, from that province is teensy. Uh, se several knife attacks. I mean, yeah. it, it's just nothing. And the Chinese response to several knife attacks is so disproportionate. So there's no question that the Beijing regime thinks they have a big problem or is acting like they think they have a big problem. Uh, I would say they don't have a big problem, except they might be creating a, a big problem by their heavy-handedness. Well, putting a million people in concentration camps yeah. might create a problem. Yes. Um, no, I, I accept the friendly amendment. Uh, I think they're worried about precedent, which is why the Chinese uh, regularly oppose interventions uh, to uh, uh, into other states mm -hmm. in favor of, say, regional autonomy. This is why they oppose uh, getting you know, major intervention in, in Kosovo, for example. Um, because they worry greatly about that, and so they have other regions like Nepal that might be encouraged by any uh, kind of concessions that are made uh, by the regime uh, to to Uyghurs, and therefore they are going overboard to to correct the question. All right, next question. Uh, yes, in the in the gray. Hi, I am Paul Leone. I'm a freshman at Elliott. And first of all, thank you so much for coming to speak with us tonight. I was wondering, we've seen in the news lately these two recent examples of US-China diplomatic ties. I was wondering what are the biggest takeaways from both the US-China deal in Glasgow and the recent US-China summit via Zoom? So uh, they got, the administration got sort of surprise credit because they didn't anticipate, uh, they, they had not leaked that they were working on this, the deal in, in Glasgow. Uh, so that, they played the expectations game. People thought there's going to be nothing. And instead there was this little thing. Uh, and so people said, wow, they got something. Uh, but if they had pre-briefed that something, people would have said, really? That's it? That's all you got? Uh, that's small compared to the problem of climate change and compared to the priority that you say you have placed on climate change and compared to the rhetoric of Ambassador Secretary Kerry, who says this is the number one thing, we need China on board and this is all we got after a year. So it was kind of an expectations game. I'm glad they got it. Uh, it's better than nothing, but it's it's pretty small. The, um, you know, Zoom is a, just not a great, vehicle for 
building friendships and personal relationships. Uh, and President Biden in particular is a real, you know, personal relationship kind of guy, uh, sort of literally hands-on kind of, you know, uh, <laughs> diplomacy. And, and so it, I, I don't think the, the Zoom uh, thing is, is effective. But the fact that they had to do it is a sign, I think, points to, going back to our earlier point about uh, what is more threatening, Chinese strength or Chinese weakness. The fact that she has not left Beijing, is that a sign of strength? Because he can you know, rule Chinese uh, from an interest, manage interests without ever leaving Beijing? Or is it a sign of weakness that he's afraid to leave Beijing, afraid of whatever uh, the, the consequences of that, and you could cut it either way. So I think it would be it would have been much better if they could have met in a you know a summit in Europe somewhere in Glasgow wherever uh, that would have been better. And it's unfortunate they had to do Zoom. They still got stuff out of that, and they played the expectations game again. Remember, people said there's no mention. They had no progress at all on the reports. That's the readout from day one. Day two, uh, after the Zoom, they get a small deal on reporters uh, going back into both countries. So there is some progress um, uh, in the administration's uh, China outreach that you know you, you can you can point to, uh, but it, it's still uh, thin gruel compared to the, the way the administration has identified China as a priority. Pretty, I mean, pretty much agree with that. I mean, I think the whole, uh, you know, in spite of all the glad handing and, uh, oh, we reached a, a, you know, a formal document in Glasgow. Uh, if you read it, there's not a whole lot in it. There were some side deals, you know, on various things. Um, but again, yeah, I think it's, oh, we got, we got something, but mainly what it says is, by next year, we got to come back and increase our, uh, increase our dedication and our commitments, um, which isn't a whole lot. Um, but I think, given what, as I mentioned earlier, right, the, the, the Americans think we can manage the relationship, compete in some areas, and still cooperate on things of global concern. Um, and the Chinese have been more reluctant uh, to view it that way. So that you you get them talking and okay you get some face saving deal that's 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 nice I mean it's 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 good that, that uh, we can talk uh, separately on, on issues that matter should matter to everybody including both of us but uh, is it you know it's not leading to super meaningful uh, progress all right uh, yeah in the back I thank you so much my question just about the related. Um, firstly, what should the U.S. policy be towards the Taliban regime now, purely on humanitarian grounds? And secondly, do you think that the terrorist problem in uh, Afghanistan can be a place of cooperation between the United States, Russia, China, <laughs> and Iran? Uh, thank you. So, uh, very quickly, on the, there is a possibility that uh, U.S., Iranian, Chinese, and Russian interests align vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Afghanistan. At least none of those four states would like to see uh, Sunni-inspired uh, terrorists of global reach. So you could get um, uh, some alignment of, of interest on that. But the the bigger problem is Afghanistan looks like a failure. You know, not like catastrophic success, but like catastrophic failure. And so who wants to go back in? Um, who thinks that we can do it better when we had 20 years and we were all in and we still couldn't do better? So that makes the alignments of those four or five outside powers, you know, harder to pull together diplomatically, even though your instinct is right. that There is some alignment there, potentially. In terms of how we should treat it, it's a humanitarian nightmare. And um, I think as a country, we have an obligation uh, to uh, try to get as many Afghans who are partners with us out, who want to get out. 
Uh, and so we, that, that remains, in my view, uh, an important interest that we should leverage whatever leverage we have in order to, to on behalf of those people. Uh, and if the, some of the leverage we have is humanitarian aid that, uh, that the Afghans remain need and that the Taliban desperately wants, and we use that as leverage in order to get our people by our people, I don't mean just Americans. I, I mostly mean Afghans who partnered with us and now see no future for themselves inside Afghanistan. So the, I would approach it transactionally in that way. But there's also a powerful moral argument that says, you know, we were a protecting power in that country for 20 years, and then we left, and it's a mess. Uh, and so we have some moral obligation to to help uh, with the, the the suffering of the ordinary uh, Afghans, you know, just um, you know, lack of food, lack of water, uh, lack of COVID vaccinations, things like that. That where you could make a case, you just have to do the humanitarian thing, even uh, even if you don't get much for it. But I would first try to get something for it. Uh, yeah, I would. I would give them the money if we can get something for it. That's even better. Um, but there's no point in withholding it now uh, when the country's a total disaster. Uh, and people are going to starve. Winter's, winter is coming, as we know from, uh, from our favorite show. Um, uh, and yeah, they can use, if they can use that money to, to, to address that situation at all, yeah, we should, we should give it to them. On the, Cooperation business, yeah, I mean, we, the various countries, China, Russia, U.S., Iran, have common interests, uh, but they have reason, they, I think we have, <laughs> there's differential effect, uh, and I think the United States is probably most got the crosshairs on it, uh, and so I think we're going to be most concerned about it, and the others might drive a hard bargain. Uh, on that, um, but it's also, I mean, uh, Professor Fever raises a great point. It's like, what, okay, what if we start to see those groups reconstituted, launching attacks outside of Afghanistan, attacking European American interests? Then what do you do? Um, do we go with uh, what President Biden, you know, argued for as a vice president with the sort of counterterror option? But even that, you need people on the ground uh, to be able to get the information, to launch the strikes, etc. Um, you're kind of in a big pickle if that happens. All right, I think we have time for a couple more questions. Uh, yes, in the red. Hi, uh, I just want to say thank you again. My name is Emma Coulter. I'm also a first year at the Elliott School. Um, the name is slipping my mind right now. But you, you mentioned John's idea that this is... John Mearsheim. Mearsheim, thank you, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that this is kind of the end John. of traditional John. liberal intervention globally. Um, can you just expand a bit more on that and whether that, that is going to be the case in the future of Afghanistan? I don't agree with John on that. <laughs> so um, I, I agree that um, uh, Afghanistan is a big failure. Uh, and ironically, Iraq, which you know 10 years ago we would have said that's the big failure, it looks better in hindsight now, even if you think it was a mistake to go in, the Iraq is more stable now than Afghanistan is, and is at a manageable level of US uh, commitment. Uh, and I'm not saying that justifies the Iraq war invasion, but it, there's something worth preserving is what, what I'm saying. Uh, but there's a reason uh, why America, in its foreign policy, emphasizes values as what well, alongside interests, and sees the promotion of values as in our interests. That is to say that it's it's a false dichotomy to say that we uh, have interests that are completely separate from our identity as a liberal democracy. I, that's where John and I differ. Uh, and I, I think anytime the US tries to pursue such a policy over the medium term, it collapses because the public at the end of the day believes that America, what America stands for uh, is an important part of who we are and our global role, and that other people around the world 
likewise uh, see a benefit in what America stands for, its values, its principles, uh, and that the folks who do are natural allies for the United States. I think those, those ideas that I just said are, are pretty deep in, American, uh, in, in the American idea and that, that the American public believes in. They get tired of it. They certainly don't want us, you know, uh, disasters like Afghanistan, uh, Iraq, but they thought it was worth it in Germany. They thought it was worth it in Japan. And, and they thought it was worth it in South Korea. These are regime change uh, in the, you know, to democ in nation building in the direction of democracy. Uh, and so I think that uh, we're, it's, it's a, the bad news for John is that the problem that he thinks is uh, is gone forever is going to come back and haunt him again. Is my is my guess. I don't know where, but I suspect it will come back. Yeah. So I I was I was there. I heard him say this a couple of weeks ago, and uh, I just shook, I shook my head because uh, I just don't I just don't see it. Yes, we've yes there have been some things that have blown up in our faces lately, but the historical memory is short, uh, especially when. Uh, administrations turn over as frequently as they do. Um, uh, and we sometimes think we learn things. Uh, we learn from uh, Iraq, oh, don't go in heavy, right, too much, with too much force and so on, big, large troops. Oh, well, so that means in Libya, we won't not do it, we'll just do it differently. We'll go in with a light footprint and just use air power, um, and it just collapses in a different way. But yeah, so the difference here is that Mearsheim is a realist, right? He, th he thinks in terms of material interests, specifically the distribution of power. Um, whereas others uh, would include uh, values as an interest, the spreading democracy uh, and things like that. And historically, uh, US presidents have tended to uh, be in the more Wilsonian camp, right? They, yes, they care about the balance of power, but they care about uh, values as well uh, and views liberal democracy as a, as a value. Um, I would put a slightly different spin on it than Professor Fever, which is I, the reason I was skeptical. So, Mearsheimer wants to get away from these uh, democracy nation building operations and focus on China, right? This is this is the problem. This is the inevitable conflict that's going to happen. Um, but I, I just see, given that strain that's very, I think, predominant in U.S. leaders which is the, we want to do some, we, we want to do things beyond just care about the, the national interest, or we see demo spreading democracy as in the national interest, that it makes us more secure, and so on. Um, that's not going to go away. It's going to come back. Uh, and so, and short historical memory again, I, I don't think the United States is done with this. I would say, though, President Biden has shown his willingness to act kind of like a ruthless realist. Right? He threw the Afghan people under the bus. Whether you think that was a good decision or not, that's what happened here. Right? Because it no longer suited his view of, of US interests. So I'm not making a judgment on that. I'm just saying you can't really dispute that that's what happened. Right? And he was willing to take that on and, allow, and let that happen because that was outside of his view of of his hard-nosed view of U.S. interests. All so right. Was too long. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, yes, in the gray. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, my name is Lydia Miller, and I had a question regarding um, your opinion about the military strategy, like the grand strategy. Um, I think that the military strategy has been criticized for the fact that it's not really like a strategy that we're going to use against the United States. Do you think that that's true? Like, what is your perspective on what the future of the military Especially with the China rising, like what should be like the great trajectory? Now? So the Navy is not happy with the Orca Steel. U.S. Navy is not, uh, because the under the deal, the U.S. has to share technology that the Navy would not like to share. U.S. Navy would not like to share, even though Australia is about as close now. Only you know U.K. Canada, you could say is closer, uh, but even so. <laughs> the Navy didn't like to share it. So uh, that, uh, the, the administration said we're going to do it anyway. But the, 
the reason, the logic behind it was that the U.S. by itself probably could not afford to arms race with China. That the U.S. needed to leverage our the big asset we have that China doesn't have, which is wealthy allies. Australia, Japan, South Korea, maybe in the future, India. And so that, that creates a bigger problem for China if they're trying to manage several states combining forces against uh, China in an arm, arms race. Uh, and that makes it more fiscally sustainable for the United States. So the US is going to, uh, I'm quite sure, is going to do everything they can to maintain allies. You mentioned earlier uh, that you know the Trump didn't like that. Yes, Trump was at the presidential level, he was bashing allies. Go one level down and look at the documents that describe Trump's st strategy, whether it's the national security strategy or below that, the national defense strategy. It was all about allies. The US recognizes that's our big advantage vis-a-vis -vis China in the competition is we have wealthy allies uh, who are mostly aligned with us, China does not. And so whatever strategy the US does in the military domain is gonna be heavily ally-centric. Uh, uh, that is mobilizing and working uh, with other partners. And it, and it has to be. I guess, well, uh, brilliant uh, intro to international affairs student, uh, I would say, and probably some other, others of you, but it's hard for me to recognize people with the masks when you're out there, so if I miss one of you, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, another, you know, I don't know whether Joe Biden's really a realist, but this is yet another uh, realist move, right? Who's, who are the key players uh, in East Asia? that are going to be allies or are allies, Britain, Australia, Japan, South Korea, et cetera, et cetera. France? Mm, not so much. <laughs> Maybe a little, but, uh, you know, so the, the willingness here to kind of, uh, you know, get the Australians to jump this deal so that we could get the Australians uh, uh, theoretically more capable <laughs> Uh, platform, even if it's going to be 20, 30 years down the road, um, and deprive them actually of a, maybe a less good weapon system, but that they could get sooner, um, you know, is an indication, I think, of uh, the, the sort of urgency, I guess, the, the administration's viewing the, the China situation with, and its willingness to kind of play hardball uh, with allies that it thinks are superfluous. Great. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Downs and Dr. Fever. Um, uh, with that, we're going to be closing tonight's event. Um, but before you leave, uh, please take note that if you have not already signed in, please sign in at the check-in desk outside. We're also going to be displaying a QR code um, that is for our survey. We are in the process of planning a very ambitious event next semester. We would love to have your input. So please fill out our survey. We really appreciate it. Um, and yeah, you with keep that, teasing this. What is the ambitious event? <laughs> the I'm inviting you back. Do you have to click on the QR sure. code? The ambitious <laughs> event better not be bringing Hal Brands here. That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, we are going to be having Hal Brands later in the next month. Um, but <laughs> um, but yes, for uh, uh, next semester, we are planning on putting on an international affairs and technology summit. Um, which will be a series of events about technology and international affairs. It's going to be very interesting. Technically, not allowed to promote it until we've confirmed that it's going to happen. But um, but we would love to have your input. It didn't happen. Yeah. Didn't say anything. Yeah. But we would love to have your input. It'd be really nice. So please pull out the survey. Um, and yeah, with that, on behalf of the Alexander Hamilton Society and everyone in the audience, um, thank you very much for both of you coming up tonight. Please give our speakers a big round of applause.